All right, so unmute everything, start the recording, switch screens. All right, so welcome back, guys. This is uh, our 31st episode of Ophion. Um, I just have a few points of order before we begin. Uh, the first being that uh, Mirthrin is uh, expected to join us a little bit late, so expect to see him pop in. Uh, both Beckett and Matic are still players, not to worry, uh, after the events of last week. Um, however, they will just both be absent this week uh, because of uh, extenuating circumstances. Um, the other sort of little announcement I have is that this uh, adventure might be very short or it could be very long. It kind of depends on my players here. Um, with all that said, I think we're ready for the captain's log. All right. Captain's log, stardate 56070.6. It is definitely unusual for us to be on the receiving end of a first contact scenario. However, the Ophion is making the best of it. Uh, we are currently on course to the Oshir, the Oshirex, homeworld of Sluyu, as Captain Beckett takes the Lysithius the other way to the Andromeda Galaxy. I admit to being a little jealous, but have to grudgingly admit that Starfleet has chosen a great crew for that mission. As we near Sluyu, I'm a little apprehensive. This is feeling a little too good to be true, and a little too easy so far. Also, their information gathering capabilities leave me feeling under the microscope. I've asked Locke to investigate their methods as closely as possible. Hopefully we will learn something. End log. All right, well, uh, as you are accustomed to at this point, uh, there is a, a uh, you know, about 30, 45 minutes of open RP if you guys wish, but if not, We'll just skip ahead. So, uh, does anyone have any scenes they'd like to enact? I can't think of anything. Just walking around the empty till, trying to keep it going without Beckett there and failing horribly. <laughs> oh, the empty still. Oh. Uh, all right. Well, oh, you got something, Panek? Uh, I'd like to talk to Shatsu about, um, upping our uh, internal security when we're dealing, since we're dealing with such a, when we're dealing with the ascendancy, you know, like, um, make sure all of our, our stuff is locked down, because I feel like they're going to try to in, infiltrate it. Well, uh, not to worry, Commander, I've pretty much redone the entire, ah, the entire security protocols by, by myself. Uh, the only one who really knows how to get into this computer system is myself and uh, the captain here. Uh, we thought the same thing before the Dominion uh, captured the, the uh, Ophion commander. Just uh, double check those for me. Sure, right away. And uh, she begins running a level one diagnostic, which will pretty much take a while, but you know it's at least being done. Uh, I suppose I'm also keeping an eye out for any signals coming in from our newcomers or any other oddities in the communication span. Okay. Meanwhile, the captain is wondering why he has to remember six different passwords just to get into his internal messages system. <laughs> gotta, you gotta have OPSEC, man. OPSEC is important. OPSEC is fine, but how do I know if there aren't hot, sexy Romulan females in my area looking for me? <laughs> oh, dear. And on that note, uh, we skip ahead a bit. So, Locke, uh, about an hour out of the Oshirix homeworld of Sluyu, uh, your sensors begin to pick up local sector, tra local sector traffic. Uh, much like the activity around Seoul, there are all sorts of starships and small craft coming and going. They don't seem to be bothered by the fact you're headed in their direction, or if they are, uh, they're doing a hell of a job hiding it. Like... You would know by now that you've got to be on their sensors in some capacity, and yet they're not making any overt moves to intercept you or, you know, to clear a path. They're just going about their, their daily business, it seems. Uh, sorry, one quick question before. On that on our map, whereabouts are we in the Sabine Expanse? Sure, let me see. Where did I... Put... Maybe went, like, straight up, right? On, like, the Z-axis? Yeah, so if you were to go to... We'll say about B... Or, no, that's D1. Right yep. above the E in Expanse. Uh, it's right okay. about there. Oh, so fairly close to the Azure Nebula. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, Locke, uh, if you would care to do a sensor scan, I can give you momentum and information. So definitely detecting a lot of ship activity, Captain. Uh, it seems to be a very um, um, deliberate flying casual, or they just have, they give, uh, what's the term, uh, zero Fs about us? <laughs> they could have been told ahead of time. Uh, did we detect any outgoing comm signals from their uh, from their ship? I mean, you mean the one, the OA Hange that left with the Lysithia? Oh, they're not, yeah, that's right. We're, we're by ourselves. That's right. They went with the Lysithia. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you guys are by yourself at the moment. Uh, someone needs to roll for the ship. Sensor signs for the ship. Delay. Oh. All right. Uh, I'm just going to take threat for that, uh, that uh, 20. And uh, you guys have three momentum starting off. All right. So, uh, Locke, as you go ahead and do a scan of the SLUU system you see that it is remarkably jam-packed with over 15 planets, 30 moons, and a trinary star system. It is not only a tremendous... uh Uh-oh. Oops. um, I killed Sona. I got it. (laughs) Killed yourself, too. Um, Needless to say, this is a very interesting system, if only because there are just so many points of interest and possible colonies, outposts, etc., and sure enough, as you continue to look at your scans, you are seeing that most of the planetary bodies do have either a colony, an outpost, or an orbital structure of some sort. Now, SLUU itself, based on what you know and based on your readings, uh, SLUU itself is the fifth planet from the triple stars. And initial scans show that it is on the borderline between a class L and a class Y. Uh, the surface is covered in a toxic, toxic atmosphere inhospitable to most forms of life. However, because you were told this specifically, you do know that beneath the surface is a vast underground terrarium network with Earth-like ecosystems. There's also these sort of large structures, almost like orbital tethers and landing pads that are built in to the mountain peaks that are taller than the deadly miasma that clings to the surface. This not a place for shore leave, Captain. I will be sure to leave my not. swim trunks at, in my quarters. Can I get a read on the atmosphere? Find out how toxic it is? Like, would it be, would we need full environmental suits or just kind of like a face mask? Um, I'll give this to you free. So if you were to walk around unprotected in on the surface, uh, your estimated time to death is about three minutes. Um, however, the underground uh, ecology, perfectly fine. It's it's even you know this far out, um, you're able to detect a little bit, and from what you're seeing, it's near Earth normal. Um, and then the mountain peaks are uh, would be the equivalent of say uh, Keystone, Colorado, where you're you're up in the mountains and the air's a little thinner, but uh, it's definitely breathable and it's uh, you know not toxic to you. I think it would like we would think one of those like full face masks, kind of plastic masks, ha- uh, be enough to walk around the surface without dying, or is it kind of like our uniforms will type, start melting type toxicity? Uh, your uniforms would start melting. You would need a full EVA suit. Would you like me to hail the ascendancy, Captain? Absolutely. All right. So you send off, uh, you send off a hail, and sure enough, you receive a reply. And uh, after a few moments of, uh, you know, the computers negotiating, on screen appears a red carapist Oshirix. And I'm going to start doing this, so remind me every time we do a view screen to actually put a token there. Um, So, a few things of note um, that you, again, would have learned from No Show, or Non Show, the uh, Oshirix captain that you uh, spoke with previously. Um, You're going to, just, you know, sort of a reminder. Um... The Oshirix seem to differentiate themselves by color, but also tremendously by smell. Uh, Unfortunately, there's no species on the Ophion that has as tuned uh, smell receptors or scent receptors to really decipher what (coughs) the uh, Oshirix are. Oh, hey, Mirthrin's here. Um, Basically, even with a universal translator, you're missing a tremendous 
kind of subtext with the scent. Um, you know, you still feel like they're saying the truth kind of a thing, but there's also sort of like double meanings at play and some sarcasm. And, you know, it's it's one of those things where if you were able to pick up the scent, you would be able to see that their language is tremendously complex. Um, the other thing of note is this is a very... How do I want to say it? So usually you have some sexual dimorphism with some species. In this case, you're not seeing any differences whatsoever. In fact, you're not really sure if they're he's or she's or they's, but they seem to respond to whatever pronoun you address or refer to them as. So really what's ever easiest for you. Um, And in any event, the Oshirix on screen uh, says... Uh, the Oshirix ascendancy, ascendancy welcomes you to slew you, crew of the Ophion. I am known as Shruya, and I will be your personal guide and interface to the greater ascendancy during your stay. Greetings, uh, Shruya. Sure, ah, sure, yeah. As you probably are already aware, I am Captain Barton Skull, representing the United Federation of Planets. We are, pl- we are pleased to have received welcome and are looking forward to getting to know you and your species. Yeah. Um, better. That is highly agreeable, Captain. I've taken the liberty of preparing a tour for yourself and the rest of your senior staff, or really anyone you care to bring down with you. Uh, How many should I prepare for? Let's see. Um, Well, let's see. Obviously one for myself. Um, Pinek, are you planning on staying on the ship, or...? I probably would. I uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd take somebody else uh, if you want. Yeah. Let's say, uh, let's prepare for a p- group of four, and then we'll go from there. Understood. Uh, here are the coordinates you are to beam down into. Not to worry, they are in our underground environment. You should not require any special breathing apparatuses or environmental suits. Very well. Um, with your permission, I, your your uh planetary system is one of the most busiest that we've encountered in our uh, exploration of this area of space. Before we beam down, I would like to send off a series of probes into to get further information that we may review it upon our return. One moment. And uh, the view screen goes silent, almost as if they muted it on their end. And uh, the body doesn't really move. So Shruya's body doesn't really move, uh, other than maybe the tendrils twitching a little bit in the back. But, uh, you know, after a few moments, the sound come back, comes back and they say, I suppose it would depend where you'd like to send the probes. We do not mind being open, but we do not, of course, wish to give away all our secrets. Understandable. Uh, let's see. Uh, let, you, you made reference of 15 planets, correct? Mm-hmm. Uh, GM, there was 15? 15 planets, 30 moons, and 3 stars. Oof. With your permission, we would like to send probes to each one of your stars, uh, just to gather some uh, astrometric data. And then we would like to just do a quick flyby of the rest of your system, just to understand the um, the the, uh, the atmospheric uh, conditions of each planet. Uh, it's not often we find trinary star systems that have such a stable, uh, that are so stable and have so many... Uh, planets able to be inhabited well not to ruin the mystery or anything but i am able to tell you that the fryqua who you are more than likely familiar with uh, they are responsible for the engineering you see at play today really that just looks at the captain i just look with a uh, raised eyebrow fryqua now, that's Xenixia species, correct? Uh, no, that would have been Sparjas, the race oh, of the precursors. Oh, so Sparjas. Ah, yes. The ones that, that set up all the ha- like the habitats for this other species. Mm-hmm. Oh, we are very interested in learning what information you may have of the Fryqua. We had one of their uh, last survivors aboard our ship for several months before she took a new assignment. So even though the voice is kind of coming through the Universal Translator in sort of a flat manner, I would still say that you're picking up just a tinge of excitement. And uh, Shruya says, 
you had a precursor aboard your ship, I, I personally would love to see any information they were able to share, and I'm I'm sure the rest of my species would greatly appreciate any such data. As a show of goodwill, we will. I'll have our diplomatic office, our diplomatic liaison, and prepare all of the information we have on uh, her species. That is highly agreeable. Uh, also, Captain, you have just been cleared to do a flyby of all the planets. As long as you do not spend too much time at each, I will expect you in approximately two hours. Wonderful. I look forward to seeing you shortly. Uh, sure, yeah. Understood. Sure, you out. And the screen goes dark. Um, Mr. Locke, uh, as we scan these planets, I want you to keep a particular eye for any uh, hidden precursor installations as we found previously. Thanks, sir. Also, passive scanning. I'm very interested, while we can't spend too much time looking, I am very interested to see if we can figure out how they are so nosy. Uh, walking up to the captain's chair, I just, I, you know, say to him, I stay next to him and say, uh, I wonder where uh, Mr. Beckett finds of these uh, Ashiriks. I'm curious myself. However, well, whenever we come to the captain's table together, we shall share a drink and exp and uh, share stories. However, we are here to make our own judgments. And as Panek uh, leaves, uh, as I get up in preparation for leaving, I make a, sh a shout or a under my breath comment that I'm sure that the drinks Beckett make will be better than the stuff Prague is currently making. <laughs> Poor Prague. All right. So, uh, as you're doing a flyby of all the of all the planets, uh, let's hand. Oh no, I'm, I'm not. I'm not doing the flyby. I'm having a lock send probes. Okay. So as you're uh, probing the system, uh, let's handle who's on the away team. Um, so who's coming? I'll take Zeb. Okay, Zeb. I'll, Captain Skull will go. Okay, I figured as much. Yeah. Would it make sense for Quake and Bush to come along? Actually, I'd say both Mirthrin and Locke would be very valuable on this away team. Yeah. And hence, nudge, ah, nudge. I, I, I can play my main character. Yep. Yeah. All right, and I think that's everyone. The engineering and scientific dis ramifications of what they're doing is huge. Mm -hmm. Plus, we, we need to look for a precursor technology. And Zeb is security, correct? Yes. Yep. Cool. All right. Well, uh, not to, you know, cut your mystery short, but uh, you send out probes, uh, as you had discussed before, and you begin collecting data. Uh, it is of immense interest to stellar cartography and astrometrics, um, but other than reporting the types of planets, like if they're class Ls or class Ds or class Ms, um, Really, the, the only big-ticket item besides Thuyu itself is the 13th planet in the star system. Uh, it is a gas giant that has several moons, which are Class M, and possess several Oshirix colonies. So. Interesting. It must be kind of, um, Class M that distant. That's you know, such a, a far, uh, far away glass giant. It's very unusual of a system. Agreed, but if the if the Fryqua have had their hands in this sis in the star system, unusual is probably the name of the game. I wonder what the intent of the system is. You don't make a a giant, uh, horribly complex, trinary star system with a dozen planets for because you're bored. Hopefully answers will be found on the planet's surface, Mr. Locke. Let's head out. All right. So you, you know, sort of head towards Sluyu, and as you get closer to the planet, you do see some facilities which would be very similar to that of a space dock or a star base. Uh, obviously, they're not as large as Earth's space dock or uh, Utopia Planitia. Um... But, you know, they, they have their own facilities, and it's still a very impressive site. Uh, uh, go ahead. Uh, which planet, or which number planet is Slew you? Uh, let's see. Uh, that would be five. Okay. 
uh, sorry, you were saying about space docks. I was just, you know, generally describing that uh, they seem to share the, um, how do I want to say this? The sort of style that the ships had, whereas they seem to be built, um, and I'll show the picture again, um, where they seem to be sort of these cylinder-like objects where if you had to guess uh again the front of the ship is that's the deflector uh those weaponry are phaser rail guns because that's the coolest sounding thing in the world and then you have you know sort of massive exposed warp nacelles in the back and even on a star base it looks remarkably similar to this just obviously without the massive engine in the back Still really curious how those phaser rail guns work. Oh. Well, if you find the right NPC, you can ask. Exactly. Well, I'm, I'm sure they won't share all their technological abilities unless or their their weaponry, their tactical abilities. But uh, doesn't hurt to ask, especially if we think they are. It is somewhat inferior technology, less advanced, okay. less refined than the Um uh, Well. Uh, you are given a set of coordinates by traffic control, and you sort of enter in a sort of geosynchronous orbit of Sluyu. Um, and as you beam down, I will put you on this map and describe what you're seeing. So, uh, as the blue shimmer of your transport sort of fades away, you're left with a stunning sight. Had you not known any better, you might think you beamed on to a stunning holodeck program of Earth. Uh, you find yourself on the edge of a vast blue lake. It borders on an impressive mountain range with green rolling hills pretty much prevalent throughout the area. The sky even looks like Earth's for a moment. You know, nice blue, white clouds, things of that nature. Uh, at least until you look a little bit closer. And as you come to realize what you're looking at, you see that these are actually sort of these massive panels uh, in the ceiling of this cave that provide both light and air circulation. And speaking of the air, uh, it's very muggy, but otherwise it is breathable and tolerable. Oh, now this this is this is some impressive architecture. I take back my comment on uh, shore leave. And uh, sure enough, uh, Shruya is there waiting for you, and they sort of very. I would say gently or maybe a little bit apprehensively come up to you and do an inclination of the head and say, Captain, uh, again, my name is Shruya and it is a pleasure. Uh, to whom I might have the pleasure of addressing besides yourself. Greetings. I'll, I'll step forward and mimic the motion, make a small bow with the head. Ah, sure, yeah. Might I present my Chief of Engineering, Lieutenant Commander Merthrin, my Chief Science Officer, Lieutenant Locke, and our uh, our security escort is Lieutenant Junior Grade Zeb. Mm. I'll just nod. Merthrin, Locke, Zeb. I see. Well, yes, your tech. The technology around of your uh, civilization is, of course, Fryqua in origin, which these individuals have spent a great deal of their time studying. They're very interested in learning what you're willing to share. No, oh, well, not to put down the Fryqua, but everything you see here is of our own design. Fascinating. I, I look forward to hearing stories of your technological and sociological innovations. Of course. Uh, let's walk and talk, I believe is the expression. <clears throat> For someone who's only talked, who's only met us a couple times, you sure seem to have our species idioms uh, down. Hmm. Well, that you can... just a little bit more. Yeah. You can. Uh, thank... To be, to oh, be fair, Federation yeah. makes a point of knowing the local lingo when they arrive on a planet as well. Generally speaking. Mm -hmm. That is true. You have to remember, you're just doing first contact in reverse. Yes. Well, it's not unusual. I mean, we um, send all ships to meet contact with other aliens. There's no reason all other aliens introduce in, in, um, interested in contact with aliens in cooperation would also use the same method ex of exploration and contact. Yes. 
Oh, oh as you have requested, sure, yeah. I produce a data pad. Um, here's all the information we were we had on our Fry, the Fryqua member that we had uh, revived and have given new life. She takes the pad very reverently and sort of stows it on a, a small pack that uh, they're wearing on their back. And they again do the, the small little head bow and say, I look forward to reading it. Again, this is a great boon. Thank you. Um, please let me explain what you are seeing and how we got here to this day. And uh, as you begin to sort of walk along the lakeside, uh, Shruya just sort of, or sh I'm going to do Shruya instead of uh, Surya, because Shruya sounds better to me. Um, Shruya explains, uh, we, my people, began as a scavenging race with the spiked legs that you see us walking on, mainly for crawling ar along cavern walls, and the tendrils uh, were used for gathering food and other resources. However, we were not the apex predator by any means. And similarly to how humans evolved, or at least based on our understanding of uh, humans evolution process, uh, we gathered together in packs for group protection. And the more time went on, the more pro-social our ancestors became. Eventually this led to sapience. And as it so happened, we were the sole form of sapient life on Sluyu which meant that we were able to very quickly dominate the caverns we are now in. There are cities, agriculture, nature preserves, and so on, all down here, thanks to our strives in engineering. Fascinating. I'm... And has your, has your uh, species been able to preserve any of the original ecosystems, or were your... Um expansion methods uh, aggressive? We did preserve several of the original cave networks. Uh, however, I do not know that they would be anything of note for you. No offense. Uh, well, of those locales not. are only illuminated by bioluminescent moss and more or less require a ability to crawl along the walls. Which I don't believe I or any of my crew have the ability to do so. And that is acceptable. I'm just curious to see if you were had if your species had the um what's the word? The um mind is just blind. Uh had the presence of mind to preserve aspects of what? Of the of the of what came before, rather than just steamrolling it and building over top. Now, you'll You'd be find... surprised how many species make that mistake. Agreed. I think you'll find that uh, we try, we strive to not leave a tremendous impact on the planet we live on. And what is your role? Are you a diplomat? Are you an ambassador? Or are you part of the local governing body? Uh, well, I myself am a diplomatic attaché. It is my responsibility to introduce new life and new civilizations to our own. Raise an eyebrow at the, at the uh, turn of phrase. No. Do you have much contact with other species? You are the fifth such species we have introduced ourselves to. Zeb is going to lean into Locke and whisper and have elbow on his a little weird that they uh, know so much about us, but we never heard a peep about them, eh, kid? Not everyone is as uh, loud as the Federation in announcing their presence. Yep, we didn't even pick them up on any side things, scans, you know? They just showed up one day, but they know so much about us. Well, I imagine... No, as I always acknowledge is power, and they didn't want to uh, reveal themselves until they know for sure. That they've revealed themselves now is probably a good sign. And as you ponder that amongst yourselves, uh, you eventually arrive at the sort of other edge of the lake, like you've kind of circumnavigated the entire thing. And uh, Shruya says, 
Well, that is the extent of the tour here in this location. Uh, up next is a colony or a city we have on the surface. Um, not to worry, you need not uh, need a environmental suit or breathing apparatus. Uh, the passageways and city itself are sealed off from the miasma outside. Very well. All right. So uh, Shreya kind of leads you over to what you thought was sort of just an out, a rocky outcropping. And as you all approach, uh, it sort of opens and forms a natural archway. And inside the archway, you see that the light is dimmer than it is in this locale. Um, I would say the lighting equivalent of maybe a couple lanterns uh, in a vast cave network. So it's, it's very dim. Um, you can still see where you're going, but unless your species specifically has like low light vision or to borrow a D&D term, dark vision, uh, you're pretty much having to follow the person in front of you to avoid stumbling into anything. All right. I'll take point, I guess. Okay. Also, because Block um, lives in Paranoiaville, mm -hmm. he would put with those a uh, bunch of uh, sensor relay emitters, those little things you can mount on your arms. Mm -hmm. He'd have uh, one of those kind of set up there, kind of monitoring the atmosphere at all times and linked up to the ship's computer to beam him out in the event of uh, toxic gas. <laughs> Probably a safe play. Uh, well, the good news is, uh, as you ascend, the atmosphere seems to remain stable. I mean, it goes up and down a little bit, uh, you know, maybe a little bit of oxygen here, maybe a little bit of argon here. Maybe it gets really uh, humid, but it's still tolerable and within acceptable humanoid standards. Unsurprisingly, since we are guest captain, the air is uh, consistently breathable be happy to know that uh, cancer is unlikely. This does please me. I would not like to get cancer from a first contact mission, or for any reason, for that matter. Um, what does the air, like on even on a starship, there's a recycled quality to the air. Mm -hmm. do, am I picking up any similar um, signs of, of that, or is the oxygen more of more natural, or I'm, I guess what I'm asking is, is there a musty cave scent or an over-cleanliness? I would say there? more the latter. Okay. Um, but again, it's in, it's in certain places. So some definitely feel like there's air processing going on. But others, it does sort of feel like, you know, the air here hasn't been stirred in a while. All right. And uh, as you walk, uh, Shriyu actually starts to explain, you know, a little bit. And they say, uh, the miasma of the surface is kept from the caves by very careful placement of gas and water. I only know myself a little bit, but my understanding is that the Fryqua deliberately placed uh, such things in order to more or less accommodate the formation of a terrarium. Uh, sort of ecology underneath the ground. Um, go ahead. Oh, I am not saying anything. I was just breathing heavily. Okay, just making sure. Um, now, of course, uh, the Oshirix are a very inquisitive species, uh, even back then. And eventually, uh, we developed uh, environmental suits to explore the surface, which in turn led to the same sort of domed colonies uh, we are heading to now. Now, these, these colonies were originally located at the uh, underground entrances uh, to the cave networks, which sort of served as regional capitals. And eventually, we were able to uh, establish self-sustaining colonies, which sort of led to an explosion of development across the surface. Also, uh, the city we're heading to, uh, Acrola, A-C-R-O-L-L-A, is one of the oldest cities, and it is where the main government of the Ascendancy sits. So, I find it interesting how uh, you are so aware of the Fryqua's influence on your world when they passed from history 
what was it, 100,000 years ago? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, about 100,000 of our years ago. Um, how how much record of their, or how much of their presence, or of how much information of their species exists and is readily available to the average citizen? Uh, you'll find that uh, our libraries are open to all. As for information on the Fryqua, we honestly did not uh, learn of them and their presence until we found a set of ruins on the sixth planet from our sun. So that's the one just next out from this one. Good to mm -hmm. know. Interesting. Yeah, that tracks from what we've seen. They took great pains to try and make sure their presence would go unnoticed. Uh, do you know why they may have taken an interest in your species or your civilized or your uh, si ah, or your system? Uh, honestly, no. That is very much something we do not know. Well, then I think you'll find something very interesting in that data pad I just gave you. And it really depends how far ranging the how far ranging the war was. I mean, from what we've seen so far, it seems to be. Relegated mostly to the north to the northwest corner of the quadrant of the sector, but mm -hmm. bit of a mystery okay. there. Yes, if the powers as large as they are. I don't imagine space as we know it would be much of a deterrent for the war. I don't yeah. think it would be. They would be fronts in the conventional sense. True enough. I mean, the the Federation is spread out quite a lot. I'm hoping to, that with your government's permission that my crew and I would be allowed to explore those ruins ourselves. They are one of our quote-unquote holy sites, but mm. I can certainly ask the Ascendant for permission. The Ascendant is your uh, civilization's le uh, leader? Correct. Uh, they are equivalent to what I understand is your Federation president. Ah. Uh. And is the Ascendant uh, chosen through diplomatic measures, or do you employ a different form of government? We employ a representative republic. Uh, there are approximately 50 individuals that form a council, and the Ascendant themselves is elected by that council. Ah. Usually a pretty decent way of government if everyone is open and honest. Political commentary. <laughs> <laughs> Would, wouldn't be Star Trek without it. Exactly. Absolutely. Zeb is going to just take a quick look around where we are and make sure everything is, you know, there's no one running up to come kill us. Or... Um, I will say that the passageways do open up the closer you get to the surface. And you are starting to see other Oshirix uh, coming and going. Uh, they do give you sort of a respectable distance and make sure they're not in your way. And again, uh, you know, you're looking at them, and the only real visible way to tell them apart is their coloration. Hmm. Um, uh, and the coloration does appear to be genetics-based, or are they slathering coats of paint on one another? Uh, definitely the former, and they range the spectrum. So all the way from reds all the way up to purples. Are you, uh, sure, yeah, are you aware of a species that we encountered known as the Scorpi? The Scorpi, yes, the Solar Sailors. We are aware yeah. of them. We've never made contact with them, but we are aware of them. Your, uh, your chitinous uh, color schema brings back, uh, very, uh, are, seems very similar to theirs. It is possible that we share a common denominator in the Fryqua, but unless we were able to acquire a genetic sample of one, we would be unable to figure that out. Hmm. Um, I think I'm just going to not mention that we probably have those on file at the moment. No, Locke will get a sample of their genetics serendipitously soon enough. Yeah. Okay. All right, and I will now move you onto this map so you can get a feel for how big the city is. 
So you emerge from the cave networks to see this sort of vast sprawl across the surface, uh, all contained within this gigantic dome. Now, whether or not this dome is purely energy or if there's actually a physical component, uh, it's hard to say, but just looking at it, you get the sense that uh, either it is sort of a dual natured uh, bubble or it is simply uh, so well designed that it just really doesn't matter. Uh, whether it's a force field or a actual physical entity, um, it is that good at maintaining itself and otherwise is, you would think, uh, somewhat impervious to damage. And sort of in the middle of the city where you see those uh, white buildings and that, that greenery uh, is where the newest uh, part of the city is, obviously. Um, and that is where the Ascendancy has its council. And sort of the exterior area where you're seeing the sort of black city sprawl. Um, I think the main distinction I want to make is that it's not like there's sort of a gilded city that's being kept out from the rest of the populace. It just so happens that they started in the middle and are slowly working their way outwards with rebuilding the city. Yeah, just in case of like old aging infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, city yeah, gentrification on a large scale. Mm -hmm. Everton sort of oh. looking up at the dome and going, "Oh man, that that is that is some fearsome engineering." With a smile on his face. So, from what we've seen so far, could we estimate technologically where they are in relation to the Federation? Like, well above, on par with, below. Um, I would say their terraforming capabilities are definitely way more advanced than the Federation's. Absolutely, like they are decades ahead of us in that regard at least mm -hmm. but as for uh their energy generation or their uh what's the word i'm looking for um their ship's capabilities that you don't know yet mm. and how many or how dense is the population are they bumping shoulders is there a respectable distance between each one or um i would say in the part of the city you're in you would have come up in the middle um you're seeing sort of these very wide open streets that could probably accommodate uh about six to eight osiric side by side and uh they start to be forming these sort of neat uh i wouldn't call them cues but definitely sort of lines of movement um oh. I guess you would equate it to a highway, except people actually know how to merge. Ah. Are there vehicles? Um, interestingly, no. Um, you are seeing that there are some Oshirix with the... I guess you would call it a cart or some form of uh, carriage that is trailing behind them. But it does not seem that there are any powered vehicles on these streets. Interesting. Well, I mean, We're within in a the least subterranean society. They'd be more of a liability than a help. Mm -hmm. Depends on how the... they deal with their exhaust, I suppose. Sorry, I interrupted. Go ahead. No, we're in the we're within the walled part, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and yeah, uh, you know, as you're you know you're taking in the sights, you're looking around, you're taking a look at the Oshirix. Uh, your guide, Shruya, uh, pauses for a moment and says, I've just received word that the Ascendant is willing to meet with you all if you are yourselves willing. Of course. I'm game. Uh. <laughs> Alright. Uh, well, if you will follow me then. And uh, Shruya leads you to one of the tallest buildings in the center, and uh, you would guess that this sort of building, you know, right here in the middle of the dome doubles both as a sort of structural anchor point for the larger bubble and as the sort of tall, the, no, not the tall, the, uh, I guess you would say overlooming uh, government structure. Um, but in any case, you sort of step inside this building and what immediately occurs to you is that unlike, say, a earth construction where we only use sort of one plane of movement uh every single wall and surface seems to be in use or is usable 
Um, so you're seeing Oshirix on the ceiling, on the walls. Uh, it's very similar to Tholian design. Um, if you've ever played Star Trek Online and been in a Tholian ship, where you could be pretty much anywhere uh, in the interior space, and you watch one of the Oshirix on the walls kind of come down to the, uh, the, the floor and you know kind of skitter off, almost as if there's a very subtle... Uh, gravity or grav plates in play here um so that makes it so easy almost like an inception where they literally step up the 90 degree wall um it's very easy for you to shift planes oh, well, that's convenient Mertrin says sort of experimenting with the transition a couple of times And yeah, it's a it's a very maybe eerie feeling where some of you are literally watching Mirthrin standing there sideways, and not even his hair is drooping down. Like he is firmly anchored to the or to the eh, to the side wall. Directional grav plating that is peculiar. Well, oh, I wonder. Too much harder. Mirthrin attempts to do a thing where he sort of goes into a sideways cartwheel, but because of where he is, he'll sort of transition onto the floor while his hands are there. Okay. And sort of is going to see how the grav plating handles that. So it actually slows your movement just enough that you don't go careening into anything. Yeah, and sort of like completes the cartwheel, gets back on a sweep. Very impressive. I'm actually quite impressed you're still able to remember your gymnastics training. <laughs> I credit the upbringing on Vulcan. After living on there for a, a decade and a half, everything else just feels quite light by comparison. Makes a mental note to hire more engineers from uh, that grew up on Vulcan. <laughs> 1.2 Earth gravities. Yeehaw. I think it's about that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, well, unless you uh, flag uh, your guide down, uh, they are going to take you to what is a glorified elevator shaft and you see that uh, they themselves begin going up the wall but uh, as, as they do they sort of motion at what is I guess you would call it the equivalent of a sort of a what are those things called um, you know the sort of uh, you know how they clean the outside of buildings like skyscrapers mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah like the, the, the window washer sort of trolley things on the pulleys yeah that's that's what i'm trying to describe here um there's several of those and you get the sense that the lifts are you know looking at their size and looking at how they're wired up uh they're either either for the more elderly oshirix or they are simply there uh to accommodate anyone who is unable to you know go up a wall I think I'm going to keep my foot, my feet on a single plane and take one of those. Are you sure, Captain? I mean, I, I bet we could do some grab plating like this on the Ophion and make um, avoiding people in the hallways much easier. Absolutely not, says Mirthrin. Like, I have enough trouble with those conduits already. I do not want to see what happens when three separate sheer planes of gravity are affecting them. I'm going to side with my chief engineer on this one, Locke. However, if you wish to uh, submit uh, theoretical design specifications to Starfleet Engineering, perhaps one of the future ships could make use of it. I, 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 mean, I imagine one of the water ships could probably use it quite well. I, I pointed the grab planing and then gestured to my tricorder. Do you mind if I take a, a quick scan? By all means. I wonder if this could be miniaturized and applied to booths. <laughs> oh, that's an interesting thought. Yeah, it's an interesting maybe side project for uh, going forward. Um, in any event, uh, you know, you either take the lift or you follow behind your guide and you go up, I guess would be the equivalent of uh, 20 stories, so pretty far up. And you arrive at a landing and uh, Shuya kind of s steps off the wall and into this landing and says, uh, this way. And as you, you know, step in behind her, you see that you've arrived in a very 
grand open sort of atrium type of uh, room. And the ceilings are high and vaulted. And interestingly, these don't seem to be uh, grav plated because they have all sorts of ornamentation and uh, all sorts of screens. Now, these screens are in the Oshirix language. And um, while obviously the Universal Translator is able to do the language, uh, the only way to read these panels would be to sort of scan them with your tricorder and hope the uh, Universal Translator can do a text translation. So it's not immediately apparent what they're saying. Um, but probably most uh, importantly... Oh, go ahead. Just realized probably literally every greeting card on this planet is scratch and sniff. It's actually, <laughs> it's actually not a bad comparison. Um, in any event, uh, what you see sort of in the middle of this large atrium is a sort of depressed surface, uh, approximately 20 meters across. And in the middle of that depression is a circular desk where a gray carapist uh, Oshirix is sitting. Oh, I guess you would call it sitting, more, more like just sitting there, or standing there, but you get the idea. And uh, Shruya leads you over and says, uh, Ascendant, may I present Captain Skull, Mr. Murthrin's Locke and Zeb. And uh, the Ascendant uh, looks up and kind of looks at each of you in turn and says, it is good to meet you. I am Ascendant Avant, and I understand that you may have had a few questions for me. It's a pleasure to meet you, Ascendant Avant. We're very interested in learning as much as we can about the uh, Oshirix. Um, and your, your, our first meeting um, with Cap Captain Nonshan, Nonsho, sorry, was indicated that you actually have an active member, are actively interested in joining with the Federation. That is correct. We have been studying the activity of the Federation as best we can for several years, almost a decade really. And while we were very hesitant to uh, introduce ourselves during your war with the Dominion, uh, we believe that now, in the years following, that it is about time for us to sort of set the groundwork for a greater alliance or perhaps us joining outright. Might I ask, uh, your species must be several thousand years old. Why the sudden desire to be part of something galaxy-spanning? Well, I would quote one of our greatest adventurers and explorers in that when one finds a portal to a place that is new, one should best go with allies. <laughs> ah, you are referring to Nonsho and Captain Beckett of the Lysithius. That is correct. Well, I wish them well on their journey. Um, if you are, based on what little I've seen, you would appear to be a prime candidate for federation membership of course there would be a standard diplomatics back and forth and negotiations and all that fun long uh, diplomatic procedure that admittedly i don't have as much patience for as others on my crew but you would be certainly welcome although of immediate interest would be your ability for or your uh, capabilities for monitoring and observing other species without being seen. I must say it's both intriguing and admittedly sort of unsettling. Well, I think you'll find that we are, while we are maybe perhaps what could be considered a invasive uh, species when it comes to observing others, we do try to uh, enact a policy of non-interference similar to what I understand is your prime directive. We certainly do our, we certainly make it a, our priority to not interfere with species until they are, until they develop the ability to explore space, space on their own. Well, I think you'll find that our mindset on the matter is much the same. Oh. And and to be fair, even Federation observation blinds can 
be pretty invasive if they go wrong. Yeah, because you know those that's never happened, not once. <laughs> it is extremely rare. Yes, thankfully. <clears throat> Uh, what did you think of our war with the Dominion uh, when you were observing it? Well, we were very worried there for a small amount of time that the Dominion would overrun the Federation. Uh, however, it all seems to have worked out for the better. Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, we certainly didn't come away in, on any better terms with the Jangelings than before, but well, at least they seem to be content to let us be. Also, I'd like to point out that we did not start that war and tried at every opportunity to avoid um, initiating the conflict. I, if we're, I mean, if we're pointing fingers, it was really the Romulans who kind of sparked it off. <clears throat> mm. yeah. Always blame the Romulans. They're treacherous and up to no good at all times. Now, now, the Romulans have come a long ways in the last few years. Let's not, let's not uh, resurrect old uh, prejudices against a, um, a race that is overcoming its dark pre predilections. Belarus is a little too close to Romulan territory for me to be entirely unbiased about them. I mean, like, I, I can imagine, like, if, I don't know, say, humanity had ended up invading one or two planets, they'd probably be a little distrusted as well. So all of this happens, and you just have this miniature conversation, uh, and eventually <laughs> yep. there's sort of a, a coughing sound. It's, it's <laughs> just sort of to remind you that you're you're in the presence of the Ascendant. And uh, Shruya oh, yes, says... Right. Uh, oh. Diplomacy. Yeah, oh, it's it's up. Uh, Shruya says, uh, Well, if you gentlemen are finished with our Ascendant, I believe I actually can show you uh, what you're after, how we observe others. Of course. Ascendant, it has been an absolute honor to meet you and and spend some time with you well thank you i look forward to our greater species uh interacting and yeah um you know sure you at that point sort of shepherds you out of the room uh back down to the the, uh, the ground floor and back outside and for this uh she kind of turns to you and says if you do not mind, we will be using our transporters to transition to the temple. Is this acceptable? Very well. Right. Sounds good. So again, there is uh, no uh, audible uh, sort of communication, but after a few moments, you begin to feel yourselves dematerialize in a shimmering uh, orange light. And as this orange light dissipates and you reassemble, uh, you find yourselves in front of a grand temple on one of the highest mountain peaks. Um, now, what's important again is that the air here is thin, but it is still breathable. Uh, I would, though, recommend against any strenuous activity if need be, because um, you could pass out very easily. Um, but other than that, uh, again, air is breathable. Uh, it's a little bit cold, uh, but nothing you can't handle. And uh, Shruya sort of says, uh, this is the Temple of Yitern, and it is named after one of the very first Oshirix explorers to journey above the clouds. They return to our people with great stories of the stars, which in turn help motivate the Oshirix expansion out of our caverns. And this particular temple is where the technology that enables the Ascendancy to listen in uh, is contained, if you'll follow me. I find it interest. Uh, I find it interesting that all of the facilities that are related to space-based explorations or communications seem to hold a religious reverence to you. Um, as similarly, I could not help but notice a bit of religious uh, genuflecting when accepting the data on the Fryqua. Do you hold how deep or? Uh, is your uh, 
religion based on space, or is this a recent, or is this something that has been a long, uh, has been long in your species history? I would say both, Captain. We are of the belief that there was some form of intelligent design beyond the Fryqua. I know this sometimes flies in the face of modern science, but our species, when they first saw the stars for themselves, really thought that the beauty that they were seeing had to have come from some higher power. And even, and once you got out and started exploring and discovered other facts about the universe, that I find it fascinating, actually, that that did not supersede your religious sense of wonder, but instead in, uh, enhanced it? That is correct. Uh, I think you will find that we are not, I believe the expression is, we are not uh, religious <laughs> zealots. We are very much aware that sometimes science overrides religion and vice versa. And we like to think we keep it contained. And then uh, in the same sort of monotone voice, they also uh, add, not to worry, we will not be going door to door asking you to join our religion. I would have politely, decl I would have politely heard you out, but at the end it declined. As I say with a smirk, then realize, crap, I'm on a diplomatic mission, um, and go back to poker facing it. <laughs> out, out of curiosity, what sort of vibe has Mirthrim been getting off the Oshirix as they've been going through? Uh, so far, uh, you've actually not sensed anything. Uh, they are either mm. immune to your Betazoid senses, or their emotions are so self-contained. alien. Yeah, either they're alien or so self-contained that you're just not able to get a read on them. And uh, eventually, you all are led inside the temple, which looks something like this. So to kind of describe what you're seeing um, is, again, this is a very vast and open space. And every single surface uh, in the triangular-shaped room is, again, seemingly in use. So... You know, you're again seeing Oshirix and equipment on the walls. Um, but probably what's most important here is the multitude of portals that you're seeing. Now, these portals are similar to view screens in that they seem to provide a visual and audible picture of a given area of space. However, I would like everyone, and I do mean everyone, to roll me a... I guess you would call it either a reason science or an insight science at a difficulty two. Any particular focuses or? I would like say um, if you are at all familiar with archaeology, uh, that would come into play here. History? History would apply, yes. Ah, to think I was thinking of swapping out that focus yeah, even without a specialty okay oh. so let's see that means error that means Locke and Mirthrin are going to figure this out before anyone else so Locke and Mirthrin you get this from different angles so Locke you probably are getting this from intelligence reports you read during your time at uh, SI and Mirthrin you're probably getting this from an engineering perspective because you've obviously seen some of the designs as an engineer from the original Enterprise. But every single one of these portals resembles the Guardian from Forever. Or the Guardian of Ooh. Forever. Oh, goodness. Hang on, I'm, I'm just Googling what the name of that species was. Oh, it was unknown. Uh-huh. Yep, so I think Mirthrin's actually going to sort of look at them and then sort of probably look over and realize Locke's got the same expression on his face and go, um, are these? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Are, they seem to be temporal or just like spatial? Uh, that you would either have to ask uh, your guide or run a scan to find out. Um, j sorry, um, gentlemen, could you please enlighten me? Okay. Huh? Um, uh, Captain Skull, how familiar are you with your uh, James T. Kirk history 
I found most of it to be a rather over-romanticized, for my opinion, but some of the stories were interesting. Uh, do you remember one about the about a certain guardian of forever? Guardian of forever? No, the the, oh. the monster. Yes, that one. The, the one that we still have no idea who bi who built him or why, and the planet's quarantined to this day. Oh yeah. Um, I start looking, and then I start looking at Sharia. Sharia, this. Sorry, we've encountered technology like this before. Oh. Yes, we found a. Uh, there was a. One of our uh, earlier exploration vessels, a couple hundred years ago, found a um, found a portal on a. Um, it, it was a on an empty world. It called itself the Guardian of Forever. Are these portals sentient? Oh. Oh, I think I understand your. Yes, that you must excuse me. Uh... Your scent showed that you were distressed in some way, and I was trying to determine why. Um, please excuse me. Um, no, what you are seeing, and they motion at one of the nearest portals, uh, it is simply designed after a portal we found ourselves one time during one of our, I guess you would call it, religious expeditions uh, into the greater Sabine Expanse. Uh, we called it the Guardian of Never, and... While we left the Guardian of Never alone, uh, we did take the design as a sort of religious symbol. And that is why all of our portals that you see in this temple resemble it. Yeah, that makes sense. Like, uh, uh, I mean, fortunately, no, we met the uh, crew that found our, our portal managed to undo the damage they caused before it sort of rippled through the time stream, but uh, they very nearly undid the entire Federation by accident. Well, if it pleases you to know, we do in fact hold a blockade on that planet. And yes, do I... these then do these portals allow for temporal investigations as well? Oh, no. Uh, oh, and uh, Shruya actually looks very specifically at Locke and says, I understand there is something called a Midas Array that the Federation possesses. I can neither confirm nor deny the existence of the Midas Array. <laughs> I thought it was common knowledge. It is common knowledge. Yes, yeah, so, so Locke will say that and Mercer will go over and go, um, Locke, it's common, it's famous for being the method that they reestablish contact with Voyager with. Like, you, like I, I think I remember Barkley actually sort of rang me up and thanked me for the idea when we got back from the Tholian assembly. Well, it's common knowledge among Starfleet. I don't know how much it is. Uh, we do have a uh, continuity check. Has Voyager got back yet? Oh, yeah, Voyager's yes. been back for over a year. Okay, cool. Actually, no, I think it's actually closer to two years at this point, but details. Um, so uh, your guy, Truya, uh, goes on to explain, well, uh, based on what we, the little we know about your Midas array, uh, we utilize a similar hyper-subspace technology to create miniature wormholes through which we send, I guess, what you would describe as probes. Uh, these probes are very passive in the sense that they do not actively transmit data, except when the micro wormhole is open. This means that they are extremely hard to detect and are otherwise indistinguishable from background radiation. Hmm, an elegant system. Hmm. This is how you've uh, managed to investigate so far? Indeed. Our effective radius is approximately 2,000 light years. Reasonable distance. That's quite a chunk of the quad. That's quite the distance. Yeah, create, creative use of unstable wormholes, too. Well, if you are interested, I think I might have something that interests you. And uh, they walk over to one of the portals, 
and they tap what are what seems to be sort of a, a console of mm-hmm. or a uh, a pad that's you know kind of embedded into the surface. And after a moment, the uh, view shifts from empty space to an exterior shot of the uh, Lysithia and the OA uh, Hange, and they are right outside the subspace portal. Like, they are just about to go through. Can, um, can it matter other than your probes pass through these? Through the micro wormholes, you mean? Yes. Uh, no, uh, not to our knowledge. Mm. It would, would, would make sense, though. I mean, in order to have a micro wormhole stable enough that it would last for the brief second you'd need to send a probe through, it would have to be pretty small. No. And, How uh, accurate is the, the placement? The, the advantage of, the... of not having to make it two-way. You can actually get away with a lot more. Mm-hmm. You cut down a lot of bandwidth and power if you only make it a one-way. How accurate is the placement of these? Is it down to like the light year, or can you get it down to um, kilometers or meters even? Our plus or minus deviation is approximately 3 AU. Mm, impressive. Well, your AU, I suppose, not our AU. Locke is busy, furiously thinking of ways that you could block this kind of technology from prevent spying. Or to hijack it. Zeb does not look pleased at any of this. Oh, Zeb never looks pleased. <laughs> that is true. So, obviously, like, we've got the background here as sort of a, just a general representation, but is it sort of like you've got the central power structure that's sort of acting as the central hub for all these individual portals or yeah so the uh the sort of orange middle building you're seeing um is actually some form of temple like the temple within a temple um when you ask about it uh shruya says ah that is where we actually uh enact our religious rites uh and hold services uh, it also contains our power generator, which is very similar to that of a fusion reactor. Fusion reactor. So your species relies primarily on nuclear-based energy sources? No. Uh, it would be more similar to say that we use your impulse technology to power most of our ground-based installations. <sighs> And your faster than light uh, technologies uses our uses a uh, an- matter antimatter controlled explosions. Uh, to fold subspace would be the better descriptor. Fascinating. That would explain why we didn't why we did not detect your the OA hinge until it was right on top of us. Hmm. Yes, well, I mean we've really only used, we really only use subspace for communications. I mean, so obviously there's been work into using it as a method of travel, but, you know, not not much call for it when warp's so efficient. Um, I was going to ask something that I forgot what it was. Well, as you try to remember, uh, I will say, uh, as you're sort of watching the portal that you're at, um, you do see the subspace portal, Pandora's Gate, open, and through it goes the Lysithia and the Hange. And, uh, and there they, they go. are now officially in the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, it's a shame that the it's a shame that only their micro probes could pass through it. Otherwise, it would have been a wonderful time for a joke. I was <laughs> kind of thinking about that out of character. Yeah. Uh, so, hmm. uh, and most of say, say I don't suppose uh, we could get a co- a copy of that footage by any chance that that would make for a good uh, memorial moment to give to them if, when we get back in contact i should have no problem getting that for you and uh you know they tap uh the console again and pull out what is the equivalent of you know those little translucent chips that we see them messing with on the show when they're jury rigging oh, consoles I have, the, the I chips. there you go uh yeah they hand you the the glorified equivalent of an isolinear chip have Mercer and sort of figures out how to transfer a copy of the data onto his tricorder. 
<laughs> so actually, uh, Mirthrin, as you're doing that, uh, you realize that they do not use a uh, a binary or a uh, oh god, I forget what the actual uh, numbering system is these days. Um, Binary, quadrinary, hexadecimal. Uh, no, it's even beyond that. Oh, um, that's right. Because we're up to like sixty, the sixty-four bit version. Yeah, you know what? Let's take a few moments to look because if I tell you the wrong thing, it'll flavor how you react. All right. So computers, what are you based on? Uh huh. Uh huh. Yes, I'm glad to know that the Dominion... Okay, so it has isolinear cores, which are replacing duotronics, and duotronics... So I, I, I think it's just think... called base 64. Yeah, I, I think it's... Yeah, I'm seeing that uh, it's, it's some kind of uh, duotronic system, which to me sounds like um basically glorified binary um i could be wrong but uh who knows uh in any event uh shruya says that uh they are based on a base 13 uh storage system or sorry she doesn't say that you realize that as you're scanning the isolinear chip so must run sort of go oh no that is fascinating now, I don't think I've ever actually run into a species that used a base 13 number system. And, uh, Mirthrin, it's actually about this time that, looking at your guide, you realize that they have 13 limbs. And, and, and then sort of, you know, sort of look between us and go, and then sort of start, you, you'll see him sort of, like, moving his fingers to sort of count and go, how about that? Zeb is just kind of standing off away from them. Uh, or, or yeah, like I, yeah, I hadn't actually realized that that cluster of tentacles on the back is five, not six. <laughs> He's uh, keeping his eyes on all the all the uh... all the portals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the the downsides of being a bilateral species, you assume everything else is too. Mm -hmm. um, are they watching any other obviously Federation goings on at the moment? Um, roll me a. I guess this would be some sort of, you know, perception check. But what to make a perception check? Um, inside plus. Should I make one since I'm the fan? Yeah. Um, it's inside security. The insight. I, I don't think it's security so much as maybe con because you're trying to decipher what you're looking at from the stars. Okay. Yeah, let's do Insight Con, and uh, if someone has a better argument, I am all ears. Oh yeah, and this would be a uh, difficulty too. Sorry, I should have specified, but Skull's passed. Zeb definitely passes. Uh, anyone else care to roll? Luck is just looking at the controls, trying to decipher how it works. Okay. And what about you, Merthrin? Two. Okay. So all of you, uh, sans lock, uh, you're going to notice uh, several points of interest, as it were. So you will see that uh, sort of as you walk along the rows, mm, excuse me, the rows of portals, you do see one that is currently focused on the uh, system where the Takan Solar Transporter is and where uh, Deep Space Daedalus is. Uh, there is one probe that is currently focused on the Cardassian homeworld. Uh, there is another probe which is currently focused on the Slaw homeworld, or not homeworld, but home ring, I suppose. And then there is also uh, one portal to what looks to be um, a nebula of some sort. Now, just looking at it, you're not able to tell if this is a nebula you've been to before or not, but it is a nebula nonetheless. Um, I will say it is purple in color. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. But no real, um, at least nothing visible of any other species or other. Okay. Yeah, it's not like they have a window into uh, Admiral Thesso's office or anything. For that, we are probably thankful. 
Yeah, they, they're probably sort of just... I mean, I'd imagine there's a lot of species for them to observe in a 2,000 light year radius, so they probably just cycle through them all. Yep. It's like t cable TV when nothing's on. Uh, hmm. So as uh, as you you know maybe wander back towards uh, your guide, uh, Shruya says, "Well, honestly, Captain, that is the end of the tour as much as I had planned. If there is something else you wish to see, or if you need something of the greater ascendancy, please let me know. But do mm -hmm. please feel free to take in the sights and perhaps pay homage uh, if you so wish." My first inclination would be to try the local cuisine. Then I remember Beckett's not around, so I think twice of it. Yeah. It'd be a you lovely know. opportunity to have Vera practice her skills. <laughs> now, I think Merthrin will actually go and take a look at the temple. Okay. So, uh, no, Skull, yeah. Oh, go Skull's going to head back out of the facility and just go to some, go and take in the sights. Yeah, I, I, I'd imagine the combination of Beta Z and Vulcan sort of gives him an appreciation for the spiritual. <laughs> Okay. Uh, Locke and Zeb, what are you guys up to? I'm just uh, staying next to the captain wherever he's going. Okay. Locke is looking at that. and one, uh, 2,000 light years is a, 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 is it radius or diameter? Uh, diameter. Hopefully I did the distance right. That's, that's, like, like, that's like quite a chunk of the Federation. Yeah. I, it's, like, it's I think that big... encompasses more or less the entire Alpha Quadrant and then some. It's, yeah, it's, so maybe uh, it's not maybe it's not uh, that big. Let me look at a map real fast. <laughs> Double check here. Uh, it, it, it's enough to reach into the Federation from where they are. Yeah, yeah let's see. Uh, where is my map? Yeah, I'm starting to realize that uh, I might have been using the wrong scale. So let me look. All right, so it's about uh, what is it? A uh, hundred light years from Sol to DS Nine, yeah. Sounds about right. Looks about right using this scale. All right, so if that's a hundred, then let me amend what I said to um, approximately uh, seventy-five light years. So that's still a significant <laughs> chunk of the Alpha Quadrant, but it okay. doesn't bleed over to to Beta. And it is so far they, enough they away. They probably can't quite see into Tholian space from here. Yeah, and it's far enough away that they can't see into Tholian and they can't see all the way to Sol. Sorry, I, I should have done a little bit more homework, but uh, I was just sort of eyeballing okay. distances on a chart. Yeah, don't worry. Like, the Star Trek writers occasionally forget to do their homework as well. Occasionally? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, he's carrying on the proud tradition of pulling numbers right out of the old... Uh, this, this series has... Fully rigorous continuity and nothing is wrong. <laughs> yeah. As long as it's not forty-two, I think we'll be all right. They do seem <laughs> to like that number. Never, never mind that the Federation had a transwarp drive in the second movie. Well, yeah, but thanks to that, in that, that was Montgomery Scott literally setting the technology back. Yeah. So, well, uh, Block is wondering if you can, like, kind of. See if you can find like move a probe into like Ophion range. Um, I mean, if you were to ask one of the attendants, I'm sure they would do it for you. I'm like, can can we take a, a probe of our ship? Certainly, that wouldn't even require a a wormhole. And uh, one of the attendants who is not Shruya uh, taps the one of the portals consoles, and sure enough, there's now sort of a a circling external view of the Ophion. Yep, there's that spot where we, we got hit during the, the practice fire exercise. Paints a little yeah, so damage there still. Minor eye twitch from Mithra. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. I'm just going to be interested to when we go back and look at the passive sensor scans of that area, what they pick up of the, of the probe. Ah, smart thinking. Right. So yeah, I fly right. I direct them to fly right past where I know like the sensor yeah. feeds are. Lock has uh, lock has all the com combined paranoia that the rest of us don't. Mm -hmm. That's why we bring him along. It comes with the job. Yep. Mm. All right. Um, yeah. Let's handle the captain first because it's a very simple scene to set out. So uh, okay, Captain, you and Zeb sort of step out of the temple and uh, out to see sort of the scenery of the mountain peaks. 
And I would liken it to maybe the top of the Himalayans, uh, Mount Everest. Um, you're just seeing sort of these snow-covered mountain peaks that stretch on and on. And there is almost a, I guess you would call it a division uh, between where the mountain peaks end and where the miasma begins. Well, I'm not walking. Certainly not, Zeb. I'm just out here to imagine the... Yeah. Taking the sights. Can you imagine a species that's more or less just been a passive observer for several millennia uh, all of a sudden deciding to join the Federation? Mm. I don't like that they were so passive during the Dominion War. I understand they wanted to stay out of it, but... Well, not every... There's often... There's, only, there's a few types of people in this war, in this universe... There are those that see people wanting to fighting and want to join in on either side for whatever reason they wish. And there are those who don't want to join in on the conflict because it has they have no interest in it and it doesn't affect them. We should not be thinking any less of these species just because they chose to not help a group of people that they've never met. Uh. You know that's why I like that's why I like bringing you around, Zeb. You're so you're such a talkative personality. It's <laughs> a good listener. Yeah. Uh, I pull out a hollow recorder and just take a few snapshots of the uh, the overall uh, mountainscape before heading back in. Uh, Zeb stands for one of them. <laughs> yeah, like poses. Smile, Zeb. No, 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 smile, smile. Uh, just grimace less scarily. <laughs> Uh, All right, so that's going on. Uh, meanwhile, Mirthrin, uh, you go and you poke your head into the temple. And the best way I can describe it is uh, if you've ever seen the interior of... Uh, I mean, you've, I'm assuming you've watched DS9, so you know what the interior of a Bajoran temple looks like, more or less, yeah? Yes. So imagine that's scaled up to fit the Oshirix, uh And... Combine that with the Sistine Chapel, if you've ever seen the interior of that. Mm -hmm. So you're sort of dealing with a semi-Gothic architecture with a grand painted ceilings, um, lighting that focuses the pulpit where you would assume the uh, prayer leader or priest or whatever they designate the position as, um, where they you know kind of speak from. And if you had to guess, uh, this entire temple uh, that you're, you know, looking into could probably hold somewhere around a uh, hundred Oshirix. Yeah, so it's just this very sort of cavernous chamber that just sort of stretches up above you. Correct. Hmm. Uh, did any of the Oshirix come in? With them, or are they fine to just let him sort of take a look? Oh, they're they're fine with letting you take a look. Uh, you do see that there is a uh, Oshirix, a green carapist one, if it matters. Um, they are currently uh, doing something with pipes on the wall, and it takes you a moment to realize that uh, these are not, uh, say, uh, an organ like you would find in many Earth churches, um, but this is more a how do I want to say this? This is more an atmospheric regulator, which is odd uh, seeing it exposed like this. And then I sort of make a couple of connections about the olfactory thing and go, hmm. And sort of he thinks to himself, yeah, I guess, I guess aromatherapy would be a, a science in and of itself here. I'm glad you figured that out on your own. I was actually kind of worried if it was too subtle. <laughs> Right. Well, yeah, so I, I think actually, like, if the green uh, Osherix doesn't look too busy, I think Mithra will actually come over and go. I'd imagine these are sort of used. I'd imagine these are used in in services. Uh, yes, um, I was told we were having visitors today. I am assuming you are one of them. Uh, I am known as Onde. Uh, to answer your question. Uh, yes, these uh, 
conduits here are uh, arrayed such that we, we are able to control both the individual sense mingling from the Oshirik's worshippers as well as uh, the overarching sense we wish our parishioners to smell. Mm. Mm. Music of the nose, or whatever the Oshirik's equivalent of the nose is. Kind of uh, tilts your head. He kind of tilts his head to the side and looks at you strangely. But other than that, uh, doesn't really say much. Yeah, and so the yeah, end, they'll just go. Yeah, don't, don't mind me, and just continue to sightsee for a bit. All right, so they go back to uh, working on the conduits. And yeah, uh, I would uh, say uh, eventually uh, uh, you all would meet back up uh, with yep. uh, Shruya, and yeah. Uh, where would you guys like to go from here? I guess is the question. Probably, be, I'd I'd like to go back to their central city for a bit. Okay. Not hearing any objections, so we'll go back to nope. uh, Acrola. He's the captain. All right. <clears throat> so uh, of course you do have to beam back to Acrola, um, simply because that it is probably on the other side of the planet. But yeah, you arrive back in the Great Dome City, and it is pretty much your oyster. Uh, what would you be looking for, if anything? Good question. Um, I'm... I think Mirthron will actually sort of, like, find that library and sort of see if there's anything on how exactly the dome's made. Okay. Uh, Captain's interested in the... taking in more of the civilization itself... Maybe uh, I, he's going to look at areas where the city is currently being expanded into and replacing the old tech. Mm -hmm. Just wants to see how the civilization is taking to the old stuff being torn down and replacing, replacing with the new stuff. Okay. Um, let me answer Mirthrin's first. Um, so, uh, Mirthrin, uh, when you are admitted to the library i think shruya would have called one of their aides uh to lead you so you don't get lost um you find when you begin to access the information um that the dome is made out of a similar substance to transparent aluminum so it's a very durable uh material uh because obviously it's used to on uh, all the windows of any federation starship uh however the key distinction is that this is a much lighter material um, the name doesn't really translate, otherwise I'd give you one. Um, it is just sort of a, a jumble of syllables and symbols that doesn't really make sense. But you yeah, would can, be able... can you get a feel for like, like the main ways it differs from transparent aluminium? Like, does it use a different set of compounds? Is it a different manufacturing process? Uh, little column A, little column B. Um, I will say you are able to get the uh, chemical composition and just looking at it off the top of your head, you're not sure if this is something that can be uh, easily replicated. Um, it would be have to. It would be something you would have to confirm with the Ophion's computer core. And like just looking at it, like probably not uh, good for replacing Starship Windows, but you know, there's applications for a lighter version of transparent aluminium in places. Mm -hmm. So. I think he tentatively dubs it uh, Dome Crystal, just in the notes. Okay. All right. Which I'm sure I will forget by two sessions from now. Nah, I'll, uh, I'll note it down after the session. Um, okay. So then we go to the captain. So captain, uh, Shreya uh, uh, themselves uh, actually lead you to a area that is under construction. And the difference is about as stark as it is on this image, where it just sort of goes from uh, white and pristine to sort of grungy and run down. Um, but from what you're seeing, uh, the Oshiriks don't really seem to be... Like, there's no riots. Uh, there's, it's not like Detroit, where there's bad areas of town um, or, you know, places that you don't want to be seen walking in. Um, I think the key distinction I want to make is you definitely feel safe 
Um, you're not looking at uh, the coming and going of Shirex and thinking like they're going to mug you or they're going to do anything to you. Um, you also know, and, and there is sort of like a free flow back and forth between the two sections. Exactly. Um, there is no uh, gilded city that is kept behind a wall. Uh, it is very much open. Uh, passage between the two is very much allowed. And I think the only other thing you would note is that the Oshirix use a interesting scaffolding system. Thank you, Sterling, by the way, for reminding me what the hell a scaffold is. Um, <laughs> they use a, a large scaffolding system to basically... You know how usually we build from the ground up? Uh, they are actually building from the top down, which is a little bit odd, but such as they are, they seem to be doing. I mean, when you can direct gravity wherever you need to go, why not? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm curious, uh, sure, sure. Ah, I'm curious, sure. Yeah, the what, what happens to the individuals who are being displaced by this construction? Uh, we give them temporary lodging elsewhere. And then they return to their newly rebuilt homes? If that is their wish, yes. Uh, some do choose to stay elsewhere, but there is approximately a 45% turnover rate. Uh, that meaning that uh, approximately 55% uh, of individuals who have their abodes upgraded uh, choose to return to them. I just ponder silently and watch as things are being rebuilt in front of my very eyes. And who decides when, or, sorry, different question. Uh, how old are some of these structures that are being torn down? Uh, some are millennia old. Uh, not to worry, though, we do preserve some of the more historic buildings uh, in their natural state. But others that uh, do not hold any historic significance uh, do indeed receive the upgrade process. Hmm. Yes, it's, uh, I guess it's just a, it's an extremely uh, well organized. Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I mean, this is renovation. Natural. Yeah. So it's very sort of very organized re renovation of the city, I will say. I mean, mo on Federation worlds, the process is a lot more piecemeal. Yes, depending on the uh, contractors involved, of course. I mean, this is the eventual. Uh, uh, this is the natural um, escalation of the extreme home makeover television shows. <laughs> Remake, rebuild my city, bro. Um, no, I was just very. We heard you yeah. like cities, so we put a city in your city. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just. I take out my hollow recorder and just take a couple snapshots of the juxtaposition between new and old. Okay. And then, oh, I've seen quite a bit here. I'm interested. I, I'm ready to return to my ship if you don't mind, sure, yeah? I have a lot of uh, reporting to do to the to my admiral. Of course, uh, go in peace. Yes, go in peace. I look forward to our future um, meetings. All right. So you sort of beam away. Uh, Locke, would you have actually gone back to the ship prior to this, or were you wanting to check out anywhere in particular? I was following her along. When we separated, I probably lapped one of the little uh, sensor reader um, relay emitters onto everyone before they go, oh, before you go, put this on. And then uh, I think I would have just yeah, followed around Mirthrin, keeping in a group okay. in case buddy system up okay. was there uh anything in the osiric's literature that you were interested in because you were you would have been at the library with him hmm. i was just thinking about no it's i i'm, I'm blanking today um no nah, it's okay fun little research but yeah i just think i just uh looked up yeah, like random history of it i suppose okay Sure. Hold up sure. random books from the history section and flip through them. Uh, maybe look at what they've got on the fry quest, see how it gels with yeah. what we've heard. Yeah, it'd be a good idea. I take that suggestion. Okay. So I'd go to find like the, their ancient history, anthropological tasks, anything in the fry quest, and kind of like scan those with the tricorder and 
get a, a, a translation scan. Okay. Um, true enough to what they've said. Yeah, this, this, this is where watching a lot of Star Trek actually works against me because this is about by this point of the episode we would have been captured by the turns out they're carnivorous aliens. <laughs> yeah, I love subverting expectations. Um, any event, uh, yes, yeah, so Alok, uh, you go through what they have on the Fryqua, and true to their word, up to this point, uh, they don't really have much. Uh, they do identify that the sixth planet in their system is very much a quote-unquote garden world that seemed to have been specifically bioengineered uh, for sentient life, uh, even though no sentient life seemed to have emerged on the planet. So it's a Class M without, say, anything besides uh, Oshirix on it. Um, other than that, the best guess of the Oshirix is that the Fryqua are... Uh, perhaps 300,000 years old, maybe older, and that uh, the Guardian of Never uh, that they discovered is even older than that. Like, they were unable to date uh, how old the, the Guardian was, uh, very similarly to... Is that public to... knowledge for them, then? Oops, say again? The, the Guardian of Never, is that public knowledge for them? Yes. So, like, and what's the, like, is there any difference I can see between the Guardian of Forever and the Guardian of Never? Uh, so if you were to call up, uh, call up a picture, uh, I would say you, let me actually pull up a picture myself. So I say the right thing. So the guardian of forever is kind of this brown and the guardian of never is sort of a red. So this is like, like the guardian of the variations in like the archway design or no it seems to be the exact same archway design okay so the archway design is part of the design good show but the, the that destination sentence made seems no be... sentence in co that sentence made no sense in context but i think you got what i'm saying <laughs> oh, you were the, saying uh, but the, the destinations mm -hmm. also seem to be kind of temporal spatial based um i would say that that's probably where the common knowledge ends um just that it is a portal to the unknown is how it is officially recorded uh, about that point is where the classified documents start mm -hmm. hmm. so I, I think at some point most would actually sort of lean over lock's shoulders looking at and go so oh, guardian of forever guardian of never I wonder how many other Guardians there are out there. Well, never implies things that weren't. Maybe alternate realities, perhaps uh, different timelines. Dimensions between dimensions? Possibly, yes, as opposed to all of what is and was. More of all of what could have been and isn't. But it, or it could just be a, a very fanciful name. Yeah, well, from what I've heard, the Guardian of Forever has a flair for the dramatic. Well, it's having having a chance to be there myself. It is incredibly classified. I've read quite a few reports. Yeah, how? Yeah, yeah. Honestly, it's it's surprising Captain Kirk is as famous as he was. I mean, how many of his reports ended up classified? Probably thirty-seven. Only 37? I was going to guess like 85. And so, well, there's class. Well, it is 100 years ago. So many have been declassified since. This oh, is that's a good point. Alrighty. Uh, well, uh, this is kind of where I come to the end of my own notes. And I sort of just, again, open the floor uh, to you guys to RP as you wish. I don't really have anything left for on the planet. But... Okay. I'll be. I'll head back to the ship and back to the bridge. Okay. Yeah. So, Captain, what do you think of our of our latest of our latest acquaintances? Well, we were down on the planet. We did not cause any diplomatic incidences. We weren't shot at once. Um, I'd say it went pretty well. Oh, how our standards have fallen! Almost too well. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, Locke. Sometimes things just go right. And those are good days. 
And all things considered, we have had a fairly rotten run of luck recently. I, I, I think we're due a, a nice, straightforward first contact. Hmm. Mr. Panek, anything interesting happened in my absence? Uh, has anything interesting happened? Anything that I, should, I would be aware of? Uh, well, uh, Shatsu has prepared a little bag that has a heart on it and left it in Locke's chair. Other than that, <laughs> nothing else of interest. Ah, <laughs> uh, young love. I'm hoping it doesn't contain a dead bird. <laughs> oh. Why would you not want Shatsu's murder presents? Those are the best kind of presents. You're a terrible hunter. Here. <laughs> I got to pray. Uh, so Locke gets to his seat, takes the bag, puts it in his lap nervously, and begins looking at the sensor logs for where the probe would have been. Okay. Uh, run me a, uh, a reason science, and uh, I'm going to make this actually a difficulty three. Every now and then casting a look backwards at Shatsu. She smiles whenever you catch her eye. I'm trying my best to pretend not to notice. Yeah. I think Cosmerthrin would have come in with Skull Hill sort of, sort of uh, surreptitiously so that Locke and Shatsu don't over here. It, I hope it works out for them, you know. I want yeah, your take, Merthrin. Any uh, interest? Do you think we can take any, or uh, uh, do you think we can utilize any of their technology? Well, it's definitely applicable. Actually, you know what? I am going to do that because I briefly did this. Most people sort of look at him in confusion for a moment. Oh, the Oshirits, right. Um, um, no, there's definitely applications. I mean, the, the wormhole miniaturization technology alone is fascinating. Uh, potential applications with their dome structure I saw. It seems to be I mean, transparent aluminium is a pretty versatile substance, but even it begins to collapse under its own weight beyond a certain point. They seem to have found a way of making a city size hang on a second, let me go shut up the bird. <laughs> Their terraforming abilities would uh, undoubtedly be helpful with uh, restoring the Cardassian uh, Prime. Cardassian Prime. Now, there's a thought, Mr. Panek. Yes, it's it's only been a couple years since the Dominion laid waste to their, well, much of their empire. Okay, there we go. Anything uh, we can do to uh, improve the, Card the Cardassians? Uh, well, ah. Yes, they also, take a very, they also take a very different approach to terraforming from us. Like, we tend to go with the make small alterations to the environment and let nature take over from there. They have a more active hands-on approach that actually leaves a lot of the original environment intact. A very interesting thing. Mr. Locke, anything interesting from our sensors? Yes, in fact, because he succeeded. Just, just processing through the data now? So, uh, look, what you are able to detect is, uh, yes, as you directed the probe to pass in front of the forward sensor array, uh, the most sensitive array on the ship, um, you were, for a very brief moment in time, able to scan a, what I would describe as almost like a black box. Um, you were able to detect that there was an object approximately a half a meter in diameter. Uh, it was sphere-like. And this probe, uh, more or less, uh, passed in front of the Ford sensor array, uh, seemed to be in a circular orbit of the Ophion. But uh, as it passes out of the array's sort of focus, it does kind of disappear. And well, I'll give you probes, you, but you are a uh, a science officer, so you do get a free question because you bought momentum. Hmm. Would there be any way to kind of like set up an early warning system, the probes, to know when we're being probed by them? I would say 
based on your readings, it's one of those things where either you have to continually emit the equivalent of sonar pulses, or you just have to be lucky enough to catch one of the wormholes opening. Sort of, kind of like cloaking devices, you have to be actively sort of combing through space for them to find them. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, detecting these probes is devilishly hard, Captain. It's we do not want to try to avoid being detected by them is going to be particularly tricky. Yes, I suspect we'd almost draw more attention to ourselves trying to scan for them than if we just ignored them. Mm -hmm. Well, then let us hope that they are, that as a species, they are as well-meaning as they have put forth. Agreed. Well, they're definitely a group that we want on our side and not working against us. Agreed. I'm sure their usage of their surveillance technology will come up within their uh, negotiations for joining this, the Federation. Also, if we could get a hold of this technology, it would be a very fearsome advantage um, with the, um, any, any foes. Agreed. Still, I'd say that today was a job well done, folks. Well, I have some correspondence to write, so uh, unless you need me for anything else, Captain? Mm. Uh, nope, you are dismissed, Merthrin. That sort of gives us a look, goes off the bridge. And I am going to, I have, it's my understanding that the, that Prag has come up with a new recipe he likes to call Telarian Smash. <laughs> this should sound, this should be entertaining. Oh, boy. All right. Uh, did anyone have <laughs> any other scenes they wanted to get out of the way, or shall we call it there? I, I do have um, one I want to do with Merthyrin, because I keep forgetting to do this. Sure, where are we going? Where are we going? Uh, back to Merthyrin's quarters. Uh, well, of course, the one that <laughs> I don't have a map for. We will use the Theory of the Mind map. Yeah. Look at all the people in your bedroom. Sudden <laughs> <laughs> surprise party. Well, considering he is part Beta Zed. Yeah, surprising mm. him is pretty hard. All right, but yeah, you uh, you find yourself back in your quarters. Yep. So uh, yeah, Merthyrin sort of goes in, sort of goes to his desk, calls up the screen, and then just starts dictating a message. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and he sort of says, sort of starts with, Hello. Uh, 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 "Let me start this. I, I probably should have written this down rather than tried to add a bit." But. Uh, yeah, he just sits there and starts going, Hello there. Uh, I really should have gotten, uh, tried to come by when we were in, when we were near Vulcan, but, uh, uh, you know, you know how star leaders, like, here at one place, go on the next. I just thought I'd get, get you up to speed. Uh, I'd uh, appraise you of how things have been here on the Earth, Your Honor. I know you're not ones for sentiment, but uh, I figure it will be enlightening for you. And he then proceeds to just send a letter home to his Vulcan parents. Very nice. Very nice. I'm sure your mother will appreciate it. Well, in a Vulcan way, anyway. The, 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 they, do, they are very stoic, but, you know, it's hard to hide emotions from a beta Z. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well... Anyone have anything else? Uh, I do want to know what's in the, the gift bag. Uh, in the gift bag is actually a bottle of your favorite beverage. I don't know what that beverage is, otherwise I would tell you. She's probably seen Locke drink a lot of Pilsners, so... Okay, well then, that's, what it, that's the bottle. Oh, and there's also a note that says, uh, My quarter's 8 o'clock. <laughs> Locke gets extremely blue. And squirms in his seat. <laughs> and I think that is actually the, the best time to end the session. All right. So uh, thank you guys for sitting through this with me. I, I know that was a little bit uh, more of a RP and sort of a, an explanation type session, but I figured we could use it uh, after our sort of exciting adventures of the past couple weeks. Um of course, players stick around, um, but I have one other thing to say before I, I end the stream, and I forgot to say this at the top of the hour. Um, 
just so anyone watching is aware, I am considering uh, starting up a Tuesday campaign uh, set on a Dauntless class. Uh, if you are at all interested in this, um, I'm going to put a link uh, to the applications in the description on Twitch and on YouTube. And yeah, just follow the link. It tells you everything you need to know about the setting and the premise and should walk you through an application. Um, but other than that, uh, I'm going to end the stream here. Uh, players, of course, stick around. But to anyone watching on YouTube or Twitch, of course, thank you so much. And I will see you later. Bye-bye. Bye, y'all. -bye. Bye,